Um, again, we are picking up here in Romans chapter 6. Uh, again, we covered a lot of material. Uh, this is the issue of sanctification. The first aspect of our sanctification God had to do for us is something we could not do for ourselves. And therefore, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, took us and baptized us in the Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And therefore, we are identified in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. That is the foundation of our sanctification. That's the foundation, foundational knowledge of knowing how to possess your mortal body in this life. And again, oftentimes there's a lot of disconnect of how this knowledge, how this information can affect my body. Well, that's what Romans 6, 7, 8 is all about. And, um, and again, what we've, we've learned so far is just the basics. We've learned that being dead to sin is not the issue of sin being dead. It's not the issue of me being dead. It's the issue of my relationship, your relationship to sin is now dead. And again, that, that the, the relationship we once had being under it is it was our master. It had dominion over us. And therefore, we were sub subject to it. All we could do was yield to it. In fact, we had no claim and right over our body to do anything good for God. We could do good in the world's eyes, no doubt about it, but we could not do anything that was pleasing in God's sight. What had to take place is we need to be baptized into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and therefore now we no longer, we're going we're to get to it, verse 6, we no longer have a body of sin. We still have a body, but it's not a body of sin. And we have legal, rightful claim to deny sin in this mortal body. Again, we don't have to automatically yield to it based upon what Christ has done for us and us being identified in Him. We can now, although it will appeal to us, it will appeal to the lust of the flesh that we uh, still have as, as sin hasn't been eradicated out of this body, but we can have the grace of God to abound in the details of our life still being in this mortal body. And that is to manifest the greatest power at God's disposal, His grace, and the abundance of His grace. And therefore actually have and know. There's nothing greater than knowing that what you're doing is pleasing to God. And therefore how you're doing it is the way in which you're supposed to do it. I can't tell you. I've, in my short 27 years of life, I've been down other paths, roads of how to live unto God. Not knowing fully. Not knowing 100%. Whether what I was doing was not only pleasing to God, but how I was doing it is the way that He wanted me to do it. If you want the information, Romans 6 starts it all. It's, it's absolutely fabulous. And that's what He wants us to have. In fact, in light of that, come with me to Colossians real quick. Colossians, Colossians chapter 2. Now there's a lot more in regards to knowledge that we're going to have that Colossians has in mind but it also it includes the knowledge and the understanding we're getting in Romans 6. Look at Colossians chapter 2. And we're just jumping in. I just want to just let's highlight this issue of having an assurance of what you're going to not only produce based upon, based upon the knowledge you're having, but and also how you're doing it. You can have assurance that it's pleasing unto God. That's the way in which he's supposed to do it. Look at verse 2 of Colossians 2. He says, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the what? Full assurance of what? Understanding. If you don't know what that is, if you don't know what you're supposed to understand, at least know that you're supposed to have a full assurance of understanding some things. And you can have a full assurance of understanding not only how to... Uh, possess this vessel, this mortal body, but also therefore the things that are going to come forth, the fruit which you're going to generate, really he's going to generate within you, and they're going to come out is pleasing to God. You can have a full assurance of understanding that. They're, they're, so that you're not even questioning, was this something that, that God was pleased with? I don't know about this. You can have that full assurance of understanding. That's the power of what we're being given. We'll turn back again now to 1 Corinthians uh, 1 Corinthians, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. We left off last time talking a little bit more in detail regarding the glory of the Father there in verse 4. That's not just the issue that the Father raised him from the dead, but the glory of the Father, his plan and his purpose that he has in Christ that we have now become a partaker of. And therefore, since we are identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, one of the things that that has provided for us is that we should walk in newness of life. Notice again there at the end of verse 4, 
after that comma there, after the glory of the Father, he says, even so. And again, that word even is designed to intensify everything that he's been explaining. It's designed to not only connect what he previously said with, about, with what he's about to just say, but it also intensifies. It's, it's one of those words that's supposed to work in you to produce a zeal and enthusiasm. However that looks in you, you know that, but that's what it's designed to do. Even so, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also, that's how I read that sometimes, we also should walk in newness of life. And again, that newness of life, it's one big noun, not just life, nor is it a new life. It is that, but it's a newness of life. And, and everything that entails, and again, we talked about that, that's very general. And you've got to be able to look at things and, and question, how much information is my father giving me at this juncture? Because when he says newness of life, that's not much information. It's very broad. It's very general. But... And so he's just describing the kind of life we have. All the details, he's going to start to fill them in as we go on. But he's just giving us the basic radical root concepts right now. That we should walk in newness of life. We're not just going to stand, we're going to walk. And we're going to walk, not in the, our old life, not in the way in which we used to walk, and the mechanics of the way we used to walk, and the, the knowledge we used to walk after. But now we're going to have, a, we're going to have new knowledge... And we're going to know how to walk. We're going to know that we're, what we're walking after is right. And that how we're walking is right. Based upon what he teaches us. And it's going to be a newness of life. And everything that you look, you think about in life. The way, way, way in which this is going to work is that he's going to actually use the life that we're in here on this earth. And he's going to make it new. It's going to be newness. And the way in which he does that is he's going to change how you look at it. From, from a babe, if, 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 if we just took this at first glance, we were the first time reading this, from when you grew up to where you were at at this point here in Romans 6, you believed and now you're starting to understand these things, you knew the world, you saw the world in a, in a certain specific way. But he's going to completely change all of that. Everything. Not one thing is left without inc including it. Not one thing is discluded. And... Um, that's what he said. In fact, uh, turn your, turn your, uh, go to Romans 12, just real quick. Look what he says here in verse 1 as he starts out. I'd just like to try to fill in some of the gaps and know where we're headed as we, as we go there. So you're not com we're not completely um, Lost that we're, I have. A, we're, I'm trying to give you sufficient amount of information of again where we're headed. Sometimes I think I might do that too much. But um, look at Romans 12, verse 1. He says, "I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your." And notice what he says here: "I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by." There's that. There's that fixed principle, that essential property, that by it we're going to do some things. By, by the mercies of God. Everything up until this point is included in the mercies of God. Now, there's some specific ones that he's going to highlight, but all that he's taught us up to this point are the mercies of God. And so by those mercies of God, we are going to, that ye may present your bodies. And all the information up until this point, we're making it so you can take this body, our bodies, and present them unto God. But notice it's not just any way. Look what he says. He says, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto who? Unto God. God. He's explained the living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God before you get to Romans 12. These, these are terms that just come along and say, do you know what those issues are? And therefore, do you know that that's how you're going to present your body? A living sacrifice. We've already learned that concept. We already learned the issue in Romans 6 in the little bit that we've already gone in. A sacrifice. That's something that dies, isn't it? But it's living. How can you be a living sacrifice? Well, if you're identified in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, you can be a living sacrifice. And therefore, that's how you're going to present your body. Uh, and, and, and we'll deal with those other issues as they come up. And then he goes on, he says, which is your reasonable service. 
And then before he comes along and gives you more knowledge that you're going to learn, and then it's going to impact your, your thinking, and then your conduct and behavior, and what you do in this life, look at his exhortation to us in verse 2. And be not conformed to what? This world. He's the Apostle Paul up until Romans 12. I'll put a percentage on it, has given us about 75%, if not more, of how the world operates already in the book of Romans up until this point. So that you can have an understanding of how this world does work. And a big a part of that was Romans 1 and Romans 5. We'll go back and deal with it once we get here, but because you've got to know... It, 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 remember, if, last time we talked about how what God's going to do within us and what the world does, a lot of times the fruit can look the same. But the difference, again, is the knowledge, the information. And again, I'll bring it up again. The, back in the gospel accounts, when they said, we did this in your name, you did this, we did this in your name, this in your name, and one group of people, he says, I never knew you. Another group of people, I, I knew you. The works were the same. The knowledge was different. And so... You have to understand how the world operates because a lot of the fruit, what it's going to look, it's going to look similar. But you have to see the distinction from the knowledge that the world gives you, the education the world gives you. Some of it's just easy. Some of it's, oh, that's just sin. That's it. But when we, when we get here, we're not just talking about sin. We're talking about ungodliness. And ungodliness is not just the issue of the, the fruit, but where it comes from, the thinking. And there are certain ways in which the world thinks that we have to, look what he's going to say, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the what? Renewing of your what? Mind. The way in which your body is going to live in a God is first by what you think. That's why it's so, 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 so important to not only be in the word of God, but to understand it rightly divided, yea, not, not only that, but much more, you have to, th you, the, way with the, the way in which the thoughts of God get generated in you is in the order in which he gives you the information. Just like any good teacher, they start you in chapter one. They don't start you in chapter 10. And they're going to produce the thoughts in which you're supposed to produce so you can get... Whatever problems you're facing, whatever, uh, I'm talking about education, the, 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 the math problems you're facing, that you know how to answer them because you had generated in you the right way in which to do it. And that's the same thing with God. In fact, Romans 12 verse 1, that verse is designed so you can't go on unless you know what a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God means. It's, it's like your credentials. You've been educated far enough, and you know what a living sacrifice is, and you know what holy is, and you know what acceptable is, not just generally, but in the context. That holy issue comes in Romans 8, and he doesn't even bring up the word there. The acceptable issue comes up in the end of Romans 8, and by the time we get out of Romans 11. Acceptable is the issue of understanding you're not Israel's program, you're in this program. You're, you're, you're a part of this, the mystery that you can't be ignorant of. If you're ignorant of, you can't present yourself acceptable. You could present yourself a living sacrifice and holy, but not acceptable. And so all, each one of those things are vitally important. They're, they're like, it's like a package that you have to have. It's just that important to get the information in its sense and sequence. And so, <clears throat> I don't know what I was talking about, but anyway, <clears throat> anyways, that <clears throat> I remember now, Excuse me. <clears throat> that newness of life. And it's going to be the way in which you think of, the way in which you see things. We're going to still be in this world, but we're going to think about the world and we're going to conduct ourselves in the world vastly different. And so that begins there in Romans 12, as far as in, in full force. But it starts back here in Romans 6. Turn back to Romans 6. So that's just a little more description of that newness of life. Now in verse 5, he's going to further explain and amplify what he brought out in verse 4. And what he brought out in verse 4, again, was the exacting nature of our identification with Christ. His death, his burial, and his resurrection. And he's going to further explain and amplify upon that in verse 5. He says, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, 
we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, notice he brings out the two major components of that. The death and his resurrection. What he's going to do is he's going to follow that pattern. The first thing, there's the issue of the likeness of his death. He's going to further describe that and give further detail of that in verses 6 and 7. And then what he's going to do in verses 8 through 10 is he's going to talk about the, the, the resurrection. Each one of these issues or components of our identification with Christ is death burials involved, we'll see that is involved in his death and his resurrection, have specific things that they're going to bring out that we need to know and understand so that we can have the full package of doctrine, as it were, to be able to restrain sin. Therefore, every one of these words, every one of these verses, uh, have a, they're designed to do something. They're designed to make you think something. So that you can, therefore, in verse 11, do what he says. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He doesn't say verse 11 in verse 8. He says verse 11 after those first 10 verses. So all those 10 verses go into that verse 11. Does that make sense? So he's going to talk about the issue of his death in verses 6 and 7, and then the issue of his resurrection in verses 8, 9, and 10. But again, let's look at, look at what he's going to start to bring out here in verse 5. He says, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now when he says, for if, again that for is the further explanation and amplification of everything he's said up until this point, but that word if, often there's different ways in which the word if can be used in the English language. Uh, you can use a conditional if. If you do this, then this. Um, this if is what they what was called, is, uh, an if and it's true. And so it's, it's highlighting, the word if is used to highlight what he's about to say, that it's true of you. And so again, as he says, for if we have been planted together, I, I got to bring out that word we, and he's used it before. Oftentimes, when you're going through these things, um, I know when I learned the issue of being dead to sin, alive to God, um, to be quite honest, I couldn't find a church that did teach it. They'd bring it up, but never to the, now knowing, never to the point in which it's to be taken. Um, again, it, it was just run through real quick. And again, that's because when you talk about living your life, Normally, you just talk about what you do. But what you do is based upon, again, what you know, what you're educated in. And often, but oftentimes, what goes unnoticed is that education. And what's fully noticed is the works, the, the fruit. And so, but when I went through this, I went through this individually. It wasn't until I, I, I came across a, a great book that I started to learn some things. And then when I came uh, here to Twin Cities Grace Fellowship, uh, then I learned some things uh, fr from some of the, the Grace authors there. Uh, when I started to learn these things to the point which they're supposed to be. Um, but usually, again, in, it, I guess just in my case, I should say, I learned this myself. Someone taught me, but it was me individually. But it doesn't say, for if, we, if you have been planted together. There's a lot more than one person that Paul's talking to. And the, re the reason I bring that up is because oftentimes it, it, we take the we and we personalize it, and rightly so, because you're, you're a part of the we, or the ye, whatever context it may be. But there's something that's going to really come out the, where we just were in Romans 12. It's going to come the main focus, but it didn't start in Romans 12. It starts here. It, 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 even before this, but just bringing it out again, he says, for if we. And the reason why that's important, and it's oh so important, is because the person next to you, and I've said this before, behind you, in front of you, if they've trusted the gospel, is included in that we. They also are dead to sin and alive in a God. Now that might not mean much, as far as just, okay, they're dead to sin and alive in a God, hey, we're in this together. But when that starts to come out practically, when someone sins against you, how you're supposed to view them, 
Not as a sinner. They're not a sinner anymore. They can still sin, but they're not identified as a sinner. Again, it's a newness of life. You're looking at that person completely different because of now who we both are. It changes relationships. It changes the way in which you view one another. This is the one of the very first thing Michelle and I ever went through when we were dating. I knew that as, if we're going to have this marriage and we're going to have a successful marriage, its foundation has got to be in Christ. But that's just general. I, I want the nitty gritty details. What happens when we fight? What happens when we get in an argument and I yell at you or you yell at me and we sin against one another? How are we going to get through that? And it wasn't going to be some therapy, which I'm not saying therapy is bad. Again, the world has its way to do things, but I wanted to do it God's way. And so did she. And we said, the way in which we're going to make this work is we're going to see each other in Christ. You're dead to sin and I'm dead to sin and we're both alive unto God. And what that means, therefore, practically, when she sins against me and I sin against her. How God views us, I want to view you that way and she wants to view me. But that goes beyond just a marriage relationship. It goes between every one of us. And again, I'm jumping, I'm jumping way ahead there, but that word we is so important because you have to understand that context. What Paul's getting across here to the saints at Rome is just that. They're saints. They're, there's a plurality of them. And it's supposed to work in each one of them individually, but then also they're supposed to see, this is, we're all in this. And what that's starting to produce. Remember we, were just, we just read Colossians 2? And we read that issue of the, the, that bond and being knit and compacted. That, this really, kind of in a very indirect way, starts to produce that knitting and compacting. If the knowledge that we understand here in Romans 6 is exclusive compared to the world, then what we have here is exclusive compared to the world. That's, again, that's how important a local assembly is. And you got to start seeing it that way, not through your physical eyes, because your physical eyes sees a basement of a church that we rent from, and the building's old in and of itself. We used to have some mold running down the, the wall there. Sometimes the bathroom doesn't work. Sometimes, you know, we, we have a chart up here. We don't even have, you know, some places they have plants and all that stuff. But you got to see what, what the local assembly is all about. It's about one another. And not only one another, it's so exclusive compared to anything else, any other program, any other uh, uh, group you could be a part of. I'm not saying there's not good groups out there or anything like that, but this is vastly different. Because the only group that is going to be in the heavenly places is the local assembly. The only group that is going to affect that creature is the local assembly. No other group. That's how wonderful the local assembly is. And the local assembly is not made up of the physical structure. These guys were meeting in their houses, and their houses aren't like the houses today. They would think we were rich if, we, if they met in a place like this. They were meeting in houses, and this is working in them. And they're starting to see one another in a whole different light. Come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I see this issue that Paul brings out later on here in 2 Corinthians 5. Look at verse 14. He says, for the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all were dead. And that he died for all, that they which live, those that respond to the gospel, they're the ones alive. They're, they've been identified in his resurrection. Should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the what? Flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. The way in which we look at Christ is different. 
That's one of the issues of understanding the, the, his earthly ministry. You have to see that differently now through his resurrection and his ascension. But not only that, again, is we know no man after the flesh. Even unbelievers we are supposed to view differently because of what he did and the fullness of what he did in, 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 in providing justification. He paid for the debt and penalty of their sins. It's not applied to them, but he paid for it. And so we need to look at even them differently, but especially those that believe. Uh, come with me, I believe, to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter... Sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 9. He says, This is a faithful say saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. See the distinction that he makes? He's the Savior of all men, but especially those that believe. Belief applies the provisions of that salvation again to those that believed. And again, there's a distinction that gets made, and that came out of Romans 5. The issue that he commended his love toward us. Turn there again, Romans 5. Come with me to Romans 5. Romans 5, and look at verse 8. He says, But God commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9, much more than, that's that specially issue. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Those, these are all things that we are, commonly, we are commonly joined together in. Not only are we have been justified, but we're all going to partake in the salvation from the wrath to come. We're all going to be there in the heavenly places if you trust in the gospel. The issue becomes this, this we issue and start viewing one another as, as a we. That's, that's, when I think about coming to the local assembly, and I think about all of you during the week, I just go through the directory. And it's not to try to boast myself up or anything, but I think of you and I think about when, when we meet together and someone's not here. And that's fine, whatever reason why they're not here. And I think that's part of our body not here. That's a part of the body. It's, it's like leaving a hand at home. It's like leaving a foot at home. You can't do what you're fully able to do without your hand and your foot. You know, uh, my wife works for a, a group home with people with disabilities. And that's what disability means. Is you're not able to fully do what you're able to do. And we have a, we have a body here. And we're all members of one another, and we all have a part to play. And the issue is, that has, again, has to go from just knowledge. It starts there, but you actually, you got to believe that. you got to start seeing one another and seeing the whole as that. Well, come back to Romans 6. I just want to bring that out in connection with that word we there in verse 5. Again, verse 5, he says, For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. I love those two words. He says, if we have, if we have been... And again, this, this issue here of our identification, our baptism, baptism into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, this is not a secondary event. This is not a, a second portion of the Spirit or any of those things. He says, have been. This takes place the moment you believe. Uh, in fact, look at the word that the King James put in this to describe this very uh, event. Look at uh, uh, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, look at verse 13. Get Colossians 2 and Romans 14. Again, the way I explain justification as the judge who's justifying the one who's in the legal predicament, when they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection for the pay complete payment of the debt and penalty of their sins, what he does when he declares one righteous 
Again, usually the judges, they, they sound that gavel, you know, and, and before that even takes place, though, the judge has the decision in mind. He's just acting upon it to, to make it a declaration for, all, for everyone else. Well, that's what happens when we are justified, but the moment that we're also justified, he sanctifies us. And the, as quick as the justification came about, the sanctification comes about. And look at the word he uses to describe this issue of sanctification in Colossians chapter 2. And look at verse, uh, just jump in here in verse 13. He says, And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he what? Quicken together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now, quicken is not the issue. We don't have the King James. They might, I, don't, I didn't check it, but oftentimes they change the word quicken to make alive. Now, they're similar, but there's a great difference when you really think about it. The issue of make alive, the speed to make alive can be different than quicken. Quicken signifies the rate, the rate of speed. It's that fast. Make alive, you know, when you wake up from bed, uh, you know, wiping the eyes out. And, uh, you don't, usually, you don't just get up and put your feet on, uh, on the bed and just go start running a marathon or something. You've got to wake up, you know, maybe get your coffee. I see a lot of coffee cups here. You know, you've got to get your coffee and, and those type of things. And then, you, and then you're, you're, you're at the level of capacity where you can maybe go run. That's not what quicken describes. Quicken describes boom. It's like the alarm goes off and you're already three miles down the road. It's, it's just that quick. That's why when he says there in Hebrews 4, verse 5, that the word of God is quick. It, it's not, there's no lagging of the word of God when it works effectually in you. Of uh, It's got to you know, pull this trigger and this trigger and this trigger. No, when you believe it, boom. It, that's the power we have. So when you're in a predicament and you need the, the doctrine to apply in your life, the, the way, the, if it's hindering or if it's taking a while to do its work, it's not the word of God's problem. Whose problem is it? Ours. So again, this issue is, is, is quick. Our identity with him. Look at, uh, look at Romans 4. and Look how this is also kind of described here. I always wondered why he brings it up this way here in Romans 14. And I believe it's the same type of concept. We'll eventually deal with it more when we get to Romans 14. But look what he says, Romans 14, verse 9. He says, For to this end Christ both died and rose and what? Revived. Revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. You know, he could have just arose and, not, you know, and been alive, but not you know, really revived. Revived describes that, that, that life. And revive it, it, it also has that... Uh, uh, the significance of, of the, the, the quickening type issue. And so, again, the, this issue of our identity with Christ, it took place the moment that we believed. All right? Now turn back to Romans 6. For if we have been, it took place the moment we believed. We're just learning about it now. Again, it's not a secondary event. All that we need, we're given the moment we believe. And we've been sanctified in Christ. For if we have been planted together. Now, when you think about the word planted, what are some things that come to mind? Roots. What? Roots. One more time. Roots? Roots. Roots. Good. What else? Seeds. Seeds. Good. What else? Buried. Growth. Buried. Growth. What else? Keep going with that. Watering. Watering. Good. Sunshine. Sunshine. Good. Transform. Good. What else? Life. Life. Good. Purpose. Purpose. Intent. Good. Pruning. What? Pruning. Pruning. Good. Why are you doing all that stuff? Why is all that stuff? Why do you need sun? Why do you need the water? Why does it need to grow? What's the purpose of a seed? Develop. Develop. What else? Harvest. harvest. Explain a little bit more of the harvest. Multiply, yeah, fruit. One of the main purposes, if not the main purpose of a plant, when you plant something, is to bear fruit. What does that fruit do? I mean, you can eat it, but what also does that, 
I'm not very good with all the agriculture. You can ask the gels for those things. But what do, at least all the fruits I can think of off the top of my head right now, what do all the fruits contain? Seeds. Seeds. To, to, to what? Perpetuate. Yeah, perpetuate, to re replicate the process, right? <clears throat> Remember when I told you when I had that edifice here, when you got that, that, that foundation, and then you have the superstructure and the third level was the issue of to replicate the process? That's what's going on here. And the way in which Paul describes the issue of edification, he describes it both as a building, he describes it as a, a relationship between a father and a son, a father and a daughter, as, he would, as the father would adopt his, his own children. And when he would adopt his own children, he begins to, begins to educate them, and he's got a purpose to bring them along. Another way in which he describes this is he uses the, the agricultural example. What are some other things involved in the planting and the bearing fruit process? Someone brought up harvest. Can you harvest right away? Labor. Oh. Labor, right. What else? Time. Time. And again, it's this one word, <laughs> planted, that if you ponder it, you meditate upon that one word and the implications of that word that are going to set forth everything else that we're going to get in Paul's epistles. There's going to be labor involved. There's going to need some watering involved. There's some, some uh, further issues of, of maturation. There's going to take some time. And when, when time is usually is patience. One of the biggest threads in Paul's epistles that he brings out is the issue of patience. If you want to yield that wonderful fruit that is of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to take some time. And if you think about it, we have, regarding our apostle and the, the design of edification that God has given us in this dispensation of grace, you simply have 13 epistles. And let me say only 13 epistles. And it's in those 13 epistles, not only do you learn that you can have eternal life, but he can take, again, the most deplorable person, and not only get them to the heavenly places and have eternal life, but to have them rule and reign in those heavenly places. But that's not just a, in one sense, you look at it and you think, well, that's easy. God can do that in 13 epistles. But in a whole other sense, you've got to look at, that takes time. That's not just an automatic thing. It wasn't automatic with justification. He had to die on that cross, be buried and, ro and, and rise again. And then he had to call you by, by, by that gospel, and you had to believe it. Once you believed it, it took place automatically. But that's the, the process it took. For some maybe in this, in, this, in this room, maybe you didn't believe the gospel right away. You were aware of it, but you rejected it. And that gospel had to keep doing its work within you. It had to keep appeal, appealing to you and lead you to think the right things to get you to that issue of the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you finally did. Some people they lived their whole life until, uh, like my grandfather, who, who, who became a believer uh, on his deathbed or shortly before. Now, by God's grace, he's in the heavenly places. And he has eternal life. How wonderful that is. But it was also a process. And people respond to that process differently. And what we have here regarding the issue of that, that planting is there's going to be a process. And everyone's going to respond to it differently. Some faster than others. But the, again, the whole issue is we're all in this together. And that's why when you get to Romans 14, you have a stronger brother and a weaker brother. And there's got to be some continuity. There's got to be some unity. It's not that he, he, he rejects that there's a weaker brother or a stronger brother. The reality is there is. The issue is how do they handle one another? One not judging the other, one not setting not at naught the other. But again, this, this planting issue brings up a whole host of things in your mind. Or at least it ought to when you really start to think about it. And notice he doesn't say, some of the words you brought up were perfect, uh, rooting and growing up. Here, he uses the word planted. Now come with me real quick to uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Yeah.
be Ephesians 3 and uh, let's do Colossians chapter 2. The Ephesians 3 first. There's other passages in which we could go and talk about this, but look what he says here. Ephesians 3, and we'll start in verse um, 14. He's praying for the saints at Ephesus. He says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit and inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, what's that next word? Being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. What is he doing in these couple verses here? As he prays for them, is he, is he praying that they would be rooted? Or is he praying for, for them to advance on having been rooted? You see what I'm saying? When you're dealing with Ephesians, he says, being rooted past tense. They're, they're already rooted. The issue in Ephesians is not that they'd be rooted, but some things other would take place based upon that rooting that has already taken place. Look at Colossians 2. Look at verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. What's that first word, verse 7? Rooted. Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Again, he brings up the issue of rooted. That word, when he says rooted, ought to bring you right back to Romans 6, verse 5. The issue of planted. In fact, what takes place before rooting can ever take place is a planting has to take place. You have to take that seed... And you got to open up the ground, and you got to put that seed in there, and you cover the ground, probably water it right away. But then what that, that seed begins to do is starts to cast off its body, begins to root, and then it can begin to mature, grow up. And that's, that's what he, he says in one, in one passage, that we would uh, grow up, growing up to him. Uh, look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I just want you to see how he uses his terminology later on. We're not dealing with it in, in much detail than just noticing it. Look at verse uh, 15, Ephesians 4, verse 15. He says, But speaking the truth in love may, what? Grow up into who? Into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. There's going to be an issue that you are planted with him. Here you are, planted with him or sanctified in him. Remember how I always say that's just the beginning? It's just the beginning. The whole issue is for you to grow up into him. Here, it, it, it's like, here, here he is. It's horrible, but here he is, and he's got, you know, it's just a beautiful plant or, what, what, or, or, or a tree or whatever it is, and he's bearing his, his fruit. In fact, his fruit falls falls down and that's what that's what gives you the ability to be planted root up and you and you're growing up into him that's why he's going to come along and say that you'd be conformed to his image we're just dealing with the planting issue here of what it took so that we could be planted together with him but the whole issue of this newness of life and being in the likeness of his resurrection is the very things that he yields in his resurrected life you can yield because you have his life. Now it's not automatic, because again, as Brother Ken said, you need labor, you need the water, there needs to be some edification, some growing issues that need to take place. But nevertheless, that's what, again, what this issue of being planted together is, is about. I want you to see how this is how the Lord Jesus Christ talked about his, his death. Um, come with me to um, John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Let's 
John chapter 12, and let's look at, start here in verse 23. He says, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be, what? Glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth what? Much, much fruit. fruit. Let's just say a sum. It says much fruit. He says, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now, what I want you to see, look again how he talks about his, him being glorified. And he brings up, the way to describe this, he brings up the issue, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, and he's going to die, it bringeth forth much fruit. We are partaking of that fruit. We've partaken of that fruit by believing in him. And therefore, we have been identified in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And therefore, we too are able to, being planted together with him, we shall also walk in newness of life, therefore bring forth fruit unto him. I want you to see one other thing as, as well, this issue of uh, the fruit and, and how it's talked about in Israel's program. Come with me back to Luke chapter 8. We'll end on this issue and then we'll pick it up next week there in Romans 6. Let's start here in verse 4. Luke 8, verse 4. Luke 8, verse 4. He said, and, much, and, and when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it sprung up, it withered away, because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. Now again, this is all Israel's program. He's speaking to them in parables because of this very reason. Uh, because of the rebellion that's going on in Israel, and only the little flock is going to get the uh, understanding of these parables and things like that. But I want you to see there's some very s parallel concepts to this parable to uh, our godly edification. He's going to go on to describe this, verse 11. Now the parable is this, the seed is the what? The word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Now, my understanding of the parable of the, sow, the sowing the seed, all these people are justified unto eternal life. What he's bringing up is the different examples of believers and what can take place. Some, they can receive the word right away, but then, but then he, as he says there, they, they hear, then come to the devil and take away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. My understanding of that salvation there is not salvation from the dead and penalty of their sins. It's a salvation um, through this tribulation period, because that's all what the parables are about. All the parables are about, uh, about from this time on, and mostly about the, his day of wrath. And the word of God that they're going to have to need at that time sown within them. And so it's, these are sanctification issues. And so he says, Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil, and taketh the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. You know, Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians 4. Lest they should believe in being blinded by the God of this world. 
That's why he says in Romans 12, and be not conformed to this world. Hey, you can receive the gospel, be saved, and you can begin studying it. But, well, I shouldn't go there because we're not dealing with that one yet. But the devil comes and he taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Look at verse 13. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no, what? Root. Which for a while believe, and in the time of temptation fall away. I just want you to see there's parallels here. Notice it says there's a root. They, these have no root. The, the sower comes, it falls on the rock, and it doesn't have any root. And then what comes? The time of temptation. That's why they're talking about that's, it's this day of temptation out here. But notice Paul, in, in Romans 6, he's talking about being planted together. There's going to be some rooting issues that ought to take place. And then he's going to talk about sufferings. He's going to talk about the sufferings of his present time. He's going to talk about the sufferings of Christ. And the issue is, up until that point, have things taken root? Otherwise, when you get over to Romans 12, and he says, be not conformed to this world, if, you haven't, if it, the seed hasn't taken root in you up until that point, and you're not supposed to be conformed to this world, when that world comes and gives you those sufferings of the present time, and the, the world comes and uses the evil men and the, and the strange uh, uh, woman that's, that's con uh, in the world that the adversary uses to bring a trial against you, you'll fall away. I'm not saying lose your salvation. We should have that covered by now. You can never lose your salvation. But you can fall away and therefore not bring forth that fruit that you can now being in Christ. He goes on in verse 14, And that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to what? You know, Paul talks about that word perfection all the time. And in fact, he tells the Corinthians that they're not perfect. They had, they had the seed. It was supposed to do some things. But guess what happened to the Corinthians? They got choked out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. It is possible, and you've got to realize this if you haven't already, it is possible to be a Christian but be an ungodly Christian. It is possible to be a Christian but then everything else or some other things or some other things aren't in line with what they're supposed to be. Because again, as we saw there in Romans 12, and be not conformed to this world, everything he's going to give in verse 3 downward in Romans 12 is in contrast to the world. And guess where he starts? He starts by think of how you're to think about one another. He doesn't even, in fact, he doesn't even talk about the world yet until you get down to verse 11 and be not slothful in business. You're going to take the things you learn and bring them outside the walls of this local assembly. He doesn't even deal with the world at that point in Romans 12. He deals with how you think about one another because the world has a way in which you're supposed to think about one another. And they have love, and they have charity. But it's not godly love and charity. Now, look at verse 15 as we, as we wrap this up. He says, But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart have heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with what? Ah, there it is. There's the necessity of... Now, we've been planted. That planting took place the moment we believed. But the rooting issue is there's going to be some God's word in, from here on out, Romans 6, 7, and 8, and, and onward, that's designed to take root within you. If you're as, he says here, a similar issue. Now, it has specific application for the day of wrath, but there's a parallel issue here, okay? I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but it's parallel. He says, but if you're, if you're honest... And there's that good heart that, that's within you as you follow the information. And you don't have to worry about the good heart and honest issue if you're simply believing God's word and taking him at his word. And you'll just line up with it. But as you go on, it's designed to take root. And it's going to bring forth that fruit, but it's going to be, it's going to be a process. It's going to, be, it's going to take some labor. It's going to take some patience. Now... Come back with me to Romans 6. Look at 
I want to talk about one last thing before I, before I end. I, I just been dis I, I, again what, what we've been doing. In verse five is he says, "For if we have been planted together." And what I simply want to show regarding that planted together, that took place the moment we believed. But that brings about a whole bunch of thoughts in our minds if we're thinking about what that indicates. There's a planting, and then there's a rooting, there's a establishing and growing up, maturing, and, and bringing forth fruit, and all the things that are involved in that process. And one of the things I've been describing is the exclusive knowledge that we need for that process to take place, and it be godly, not worldly. Okay? And we've all been planted. The issue then becomes is that what we bear and what we bring up is not worldly. Just like the building, Paul says there in 1 Corinthians 3, the foundation is laid, but let every man take heed what he buildeth thereupon. The foundation is laid. That took place, the, the, in one sense, the moment we believed. The issue then becomes what you build on top, and you can build wood, hay, and stubble. And you can have a building, but it's not godly. It's not God's building. You want the gold, silver, and precious stones. And the last thing I want to talk about is, to kind of describe this, is that the issue of effective and effectual. Effectual is an old English term. Now, the King James translators, you have to understand, they had the word effective. It was in their English vocabulary, but they chose not to use it. Because there's a difference. There's, syn there's synonyms, but with every synonym, there's a difference. If there was no difference, then you only have one word to, to use. But they're different words. And I just want to describe this, this process. We've all been planted together, but the process. There's the exclusive process of God, and then there's effective processes that processes, processes that, that can that, that can go on and build something and mature something, but it can completely be not of God. Just like there's a peace of the world, then there's the peace of God. There's both peace, but you want the godly peace. And this term, effective and effectual, I know it's not used here, but the concept here. Uh, I'm just going to read down through some of my notes here, and then we'll, we'll end. Give me a couple more minutes. He says, I, 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 notice that both words are built upon the common work effect. Common word effect. Hence, it is common to think of the two words as basically meaning the same things, leaving no one to, to uh, dictate or, or detect any distinction. They both denote bringing something to pass or about, producing a result, accomplishing something. That's what we're talking about when we saw the implications of being planted together. The critical difference then in between effectual and effective is in what is the effect being described. What is the qualitative nature of the effect? Effective is actually the more basic. It's simply emphasizing some result but without drawing importance to the quality of the result. Effectual, however, in its very meaning is conveying the quality of the effect, is the very things being stressed. When something is effectual, it is more than just effective. Effectual brings something about, but decisively. It is superior than any other effect, and usually with finality. It can even denote the only way of doing something. Effectually is to be understood and appreciated to be the very best at accomplishing something. It either exceeds the ability of other ways or methods in bringing something to pass, or it alone possesses the ability or is the only right and acceptable way to bring something to pass. It stands in contrast to other effective means because of its superiority. This leads us to understand that when something is effectual, it should not be replaced with other effective means without, although some might exist. It might be foolish to use effective means to accomplish something when there is an effectual way. Simply put, when there is an effectual way, should not substitute, we should not substitute it for anything else. And the reason why I bring that up, folks, again, and I'm, again, I again keep repeating myself over and over and over and over again, is because when you come to the Word of God, and if you start to look for those things out in the world, as far as an effect, as far as some fruit, as far as some good, you will see it. But you have to understand that that does not mean it is godly. It doesn't mean it's effectual. It could be very well effective, 
when I'm having a bad day, sometimes, I've said this before, I like to go to the gas station and go get a fountain drink, a Mountain Dew. And it affects me. Maybe you get coffee, I don't know. It affects me. It, it, it boosts my day for some reason. But it's not effectual. The thing that's going to change my day around is when I start to mind the things that God tells me. I'll share one silly example with you. My wife and I, we were on a date on Friday night. She's going to probably make fun of me because of this, but we went to the Mall of America. I hate roller coasters. <laughs> I, I, I've, been on one, I've been on two roller coasters in my life. First one was Six Flags. It took me for a whole bunch of loops. I simply had my eyes closed the whole time. I went on the Batman ride. That was a little bit smoother, but I, couldn't, I just couldn't keep my eyes open. Now, the one at the Mall of America, if you know it, the SpongeBob <laughs> roller coaster, is small compared to those. That's so scary. But thank you, it's still scary. You go up, you go up, and it starts, you know, you're just, you're looking straight up. You're looking out the windows on the top of the Mall of America. And then it just goes straight down, and you do a loop right away. And I'm thinking of effective ways <laughs> to not puke, <laughs> to not do anything. I'm serious. I was, I was scared. And I'm like, I'm with my wife. We're having a good time. We got to, I'm doing this. And I'm nervous. And there was a lot of effective ways in my mind. Now, I don't know if this is the effectual way to deal with roller coasters, okay? <laughs> Besides having my wife there and, and her being next to me, you want to know what the thing was that made me keep my eyes open and actually enjoy that roller coaster? Maybe it's real silly to you. But the fact that one day I'm going to have a new glorified body, I'm going to start flying through the heavenly places. <laughs> you know what? That was the only effectual way that I had in my mind at that point. And I'll tell you what, it worked. To some means. I, I, like I said, I don't know if it's the effective way to deal with roller coasters. I'll let you judge that. But what it did, it calmed me. And I was able to go through that roller coaster. And what I want you to see again with this issue here is there's a lot of ways you can do good and bring forth fruit. And the world could see it and say, wow, you're such a godly person. And that really not be true. But if we stick with the word of God and we stick with his process, don't skip a beat. Don't skip a word. Don't skip a chapter. Go through it the way he teaches us. We can know that our fruit, although it may be similar to someone else, and maybe no one ever says we're godly, really is godly. And that's what he's provided us. And it all starts, I, again, I'm kind of jumping ahead. I'm showing you where this leads to, but it all starts with God doing something for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. And that is the Spirit took us and baptized us in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And therefore, we are dead to sin and alive unto God. And therefore, we're able to reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, uh, but alive unto God. And therefore, bring forth fruit unto holiness. And if we operate from that, maybe at first you've got to recall it to mind. And it's an ever thing that you've got to go back to Romans 6 and read over and over and over again. Oftentimes when you're being educated in something for the first time, that's what you have to do. You have to go back to the book. But eventually you get so mature with it. You know it so well. It's become such a part of you. You do it. It's your second nature. And this really is your second nature. And it ought to become your first. That that becomes your reality, knowing who you are in Christ. And when you have that, what you then begin to do as he gives you further details of this life, like Romans 12, th verse 3 and onward, and you start to apply those things in your life, it's just fruit unto holiness. And you can, have, you can do all things pleasing unto God. This doesn't mean you won't fail. It doesn't mean you won't always succeed. It doesn't mean you always succeed. But the majority of your life can now become grace abounding in your life instead of all that it was before was just sin and ungodliness. What a privilege based upon God planting us together in Christ. The prospect is glorious. Not only there, but in this life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to get into your word and to, again, just bring out some of these things that um, really ought to grip our mind. And that's all 
you're trying to get accomplished in these first 10 verses, and that's all we're trying to get accomplished, is to have these issues grip our mind and see the significance of them and see what they're designed to do as this issue being planted together. Not only do we have the imagery of a, a, a seed going in the ground and, 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 being, and us being planted together with Christ in his death, but also the issue is that we might be also in the likeness of his resurrection and that newness of life and all the, 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 the path of his life and the details of his, his life we have been uh, given access to so that we can actually bring forth that fruit on the righteousness and bring forth that fruit on the holiness and actually do something if this was the very first time we went through this and started applying this, actually do something for the very first time that's pleasing unto you and know that it is, not because of our situation or circumstance, not because of the world around us tells us it is or isn't, but because we believe the words on the page and that's all we have to go by. We implicitly trust you. And I pray for our, the saints here at Twin Cities Grace Fellowship that that implicit trust in you begins to really start sinking in based upon these words here in Romans 6. Not based upon my words, but based upon the hearing of the word of God in these opening verses to, to Romans chapter 6. Because when these things grip our mind and our heart, we really do, therefore, begin to see that we have newness of life. And we really do begin to see that who we used to were is old and that we have a glorious prospect ahead of us that motivates us, and even so, we should walk in newness of life, gives us an enthusiasm and a zeal to live unto you the way in which you tell us to. So Father, we give you all the honor, glory, and the praise, and I pray if someone's here and they've not trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what they need to get accomplished, that's what they need to get done first, and that's the issue of faith and faith alone, and the, the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ there on that cross, and believing that he died for the, to pay for the debt and penalty of their sins. And the moment God sees them believe that, his death, and, uh, his death, burial, and resurrection, he'll justify them unto eternal life. He'll forgive them all their sins, past, present, future, impute his righteousness unto them. And they will, not based upon they feel it or they sense it or experience it, but they will, by your word, be justified unto eternal life. They'll possess the gift of eternal life. May they believe this very moment. And we thank you for this time of grace giving. We don't give under that law. We don't give grudgingly or on necessity, but willfully and cheerfully out of what we have, not out of what we have not. And we give according to the abundance of grace that you've bestowed upon us through the effectual working of your word in us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.